इथे पार्टिसिपंट तुम्हाला दिसतात आम्हाला नाही दिसत येस येस नाउ 67 पार्टिसिपंट हॅज जॉईन इंग्लिश सर आमचा लिंक माझ्याकडे ते बुकलेट आहे नाही तसं म्हणजे काय तुम्हाला होत Hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Vijay Nilkant from Vitina Healthcare and uh, we are ready for our second webinar. Uh, I welcome you all participants and I hand over to uh, Shubhangi ma'am. Very good morning dear Dr. Manish Bess. Good evening friends from India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Argentina and good morning friends from USA. It gives me great pleasure to welcome all the participants to this international webinar organized by Department of Veterinary Microbiology and Animal Biotechnology Teaching and Research Center, Nagpur Veterinary College, Nagpur, which is the constituent college of Maharashtra Animal and Fishery Sciences University, Maharashtra, India. It is my great privilege to introduce my classmate and friend, Dr. Manish Bess, Assistant Professor from USA. Dr. Manish Native is in Maharashtra, India, received his DVM degree from Nagpur Veterinary College, Nagpur, Maharashtra in the year 1998. He pursued his master and PhD from Indian Veterinary Research Institute, Ijatnagar, UP, India in the year 2001 and 2004. Further, he joined as a postdoctorate fellow at Boston University School of Medicine at Boston. Thereafter, he joined as a research assistant professor at Periodontology and Oral Biology at Boston in the year 2013. He worked as a research associate professor in molecular and cell biology at Boston University, Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine at Boston. He has been awarded with IVRI Research Fellowship during PhD, IVRI Junior Research Fellowship during MBSc, and Merit Fellowship for Academic Excellence during entire duration of PBM. Dr. Manish has implemented several research projects. He has completed four projects as a principal investigator and two projects as a co-investigator. Presently working on three projects as a principal investigator. Dr. Bess has made large contribution to the initiative with the development of an orthotropic oral cancer mouse model. Dr. Manish has research supervisor for MSD, DST, DSC, G GSDM related thesis of five students and committed member of PhD DSC thesis of five students. He has member of professional journal like American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, American Society of Matrix Biology, and American Association of Dental Research Section, and member of Orthopedic Research Society during 2010 to 2017. Also, he is a reviewer of many journals. Dr. Manish. Published 22 research paper. His main area of research is cancer cartilage regeneration and osteoarthritis. He is multi-talented researcher and academician. Dr. Manish presently working as assistant professor, Department of Translational Dental Medicine, Boston University, Medical Campus, USA. As per Indian tradition, we wholeheartedly welcome Dr. Manish Bess. It is our immense pleasure to have you here. Today, Dr. Manish Bess delivered webinar on epigenetics therapy in cancer. I am sure this will be a great intellectual engagement and will prove very informative to all of you. 
it will my humble request to all the participants to enjoy the presentation you may put your question in a q and a section all the best now i hand over the screen dr manish for his deliberation dr manish please so thank you for my kind introduction shubhangi and uh, i am um, very thankful for this type of initiatives like it has been started by by vetina shubhangi and like a lot of different people from organizing committee so i am thankful to dr patulkar jadav dr somkur kulkarni uh, kurkure um, uh, shubhangi uh, dr temburne and dr kashalkar and who so ever help in um, initiating such a good initiative because this will uh, fill up the gap between like what is happening in the in the research um and over all the world and in the nagpur college and what opportunities we can bring uh, for the new students so i will show you uh, like what we are doing here um and i will be happy to answer like any questions uh, after this one so basically uh, my talk is epigenetic therapy in the cancer um so i am assistant professor as i have been kindly introduced by shubhangi and uh, so this is on the left hand side you see this is a boston university and right hand side is a school of dental medicine where i am affiliated they have clinical center and they have like another uh, research facility in different buildings so just to start with because this is my first presentation for nagpur veterinary college or like most probably you can say in uh, india so we are used to present at like different conferences like a cancer conference and like a different international conference but so it was difficult for me to see like how i can make like whatever i am making uh, i am uh, doing research is making sense to everybody like on mostly like veterinarians in our field so i would like to um i would like to go first in nvc mode so this is a very famous picture from our one of your uh, nagpur veterinary college team and i was part of this team between uh, and, um, in between like 94 and 98 and so in cricket team i learned the ability to do a team work uh, team science so i i believe that like more collaborators more people you have helping in your um, in your team is more useful for you because team science actually it works and this is from one of my example so going after 20 or 22 years after leaving this college you can see that again i am still working on the team science and team work so here the picture at the bottom you can see that uh, our dean uh and this is like different team where who are working in uh, oral cancer dean associate dean and um, other team members we have clinicians and we have immunologists and lot of different people so you learn from the expertise of the others uh, so what you are lacking so we should be open to uh, the opportunities like what others can teach us uh, in terms of research uh, so that that's really helpful so going back to like why veterinarians are well suited for the research um because the traditional this is uh, because nowadays in the modern science they are very they play a very significant role so when you go for drug development pipeline or any diagnostics or any candidate going to the clinic so when you start with the basic research then it goes to preclinical research translational research clinical trial and patient benefit so you can see in basic research we know certain things but we don't know uh, so this green arrow in a uh, green box indicates like where we have the expertise and we are lacking expertise on some basic research and some clinical research but we have accomplished like we accomplished over the period of time most of this expertise in basic research preclinical research and major st our strength is we know about the animal models so we can do very well preclinical research and then we have the expertise in translational model we can understand the physiology uh, the pathology and lot of different things uh, what is needed for uh, translational research so if one has to launch like a successful career in the in the veterinary science being a researcher that's a very appropriate way and uh, here you you are treated uh, almost like as a as a having clinician 
So you don't know, uh, you are lacking some expertise in clinical trial, but definitely you can understand all these things. So uh, the bottom line is like you are well suited for doing a research uh, in any field you want. And most of my colleagues, friends, and a lot of different people, they are already in the research and they are doing a very wonderful job. To give an example, so in human, the oral cancer developed with the tobacco component, which is called 4NKO. Um, and this betel nut, chewing tobacco, uh, smoking, all this leads to oral cancer. So if you take the example of the cat, feline model, so it is when you are exposed to tuna or cigarette smoke or flea collar that develop like a oral skills common scarborough. So the knowledge from the human patient, we can use in the uh, cat patient. Um, so we can use that drug, which are used in the human to test them in the feline. On the other hand, if you, this uh, feline could be a very good model because it developed like naturally occurring osteoarth, uh, na naturally occurring oral squamous cell carcinoma. And we can do the experimentation in this model and then take this information back to the human patient. Because of course we cannot test like every drug in the human. Uh, before it is like tested extensively. Then again, uh, we use always like most of the lab, they use like a, a mouse model, uh, which is a 4NQ model. 4NQ is a component of the cigarette or tobacco smoke. And then when we expose these mice in drinking water, they develop like uh, the oral cancer. So this mouse model is a good model, but this is mostly homogeneous model. But again, as I said, like we have, ex we can understand um, uh, translational research better because we know about mouse model, we know about like different animals, uh, say such as pig, sheep, goat, and all different things. And um, we can uh, we can think about like what drugs and which model could be appropriate for the uh, for the for the future research. So before so this these steps are essential because if we don't do like extensive research in this area, then that drug might fail or we don't know much examine uh, what much information or there is a toxicity. So we need in order to avoid and make everything very safe, it has to be extensively characterized and veterinarians play a very significant role in this area. So just to start with my topic like epigenetics uh, regulation on oral cancer. So normal oral tissue, when it's subjected to a lot of, because cancer doesn't come from outside like as infectious diseases, but uh, there are, it will originate inside. In, um, so all different etiological factors such as tobacco, alcohol, environmental carcinogen, uh, diet, lifestyle, that leads to epigenetic and genetic modifications in DNA, histone, and chromatin. And that leads to oncogenic uh, and oncogenic signaling pathway. And here at the bottom, you can see like there are, so this normal tissue, it goes to several phases like such as hyperplasia, dysplasia, carcinoma, and then invasion and then it goes to metastasis. So this, at certain stages, this, this has become like uncontrolled. So, so basically these are governed with, like, with genetic, epigenetic events and all signaling mechanisms. So we need to see like where we have to have the break so that we can stop this cancer progression and get the, so coming back to like, what is epigenetic mark? Everybody has a cells and Every organ is made up of different type, type of cells, such as nerve cells, bone cell, muscle cell, blood cells, and uh, skin cells. And yesterday you saw a wonderful talk from my colleague, uh, Dr. Sadanan, that he mentioned that stem cell can become like different types of cells um, when they exposed to different environment and our body is made, made up of heterogeneous cells. So if you take out these cells and cut it into different parts, uh, like if you go like in detail, you can see that Nucleus, chromatin, and chromatin has a uh, nucleus has a DNA, DNA which is has a histone. So you already we learn in basic uh, biochemistry in the first year or second year that histone uh, DNA is combined with the histone and it forms the chromatin structure. So chromosome is a larger scale, is a larger structure. Uh, if we go detail, then it's a, it has a chromatin fibers and then the nucleosome, and there is a histone tail. Um, so epigenetics is a study where we study uh, the anything affecting on DNA, RNA, and their enzymes, such as like epigenetic, uh, th these are called epigenetic enzymes, such as um, 
they work on methylation, demethylation, acetylation, nitrosylation, and a lot of different processes. So there are several uh, inhibitors and now a lot of drug companies and uh, academic labs, a lot of institutes, they are focusing on this because they are very attractive targets because they have a capability of reprogramming the cells. So if the cells become no normal to abnormal, then there should be something which we can reverse, uh, we can add to the cells and that can reprogram them to the, to the normal. So that's the whole entire thing. And it control a lot of different, uh, different fates. So there are, uh, there are enzymes which are called writer, which makes the changes in the DNA, uh, on the DNA marks, then eraser, and then there are readers. So, and there are like certain drugs which are SDAC inhibitors, DNMT inhibitors, they are already approved for the, for the clinical studies. Um, and some are like under investigation. So we have such uh, one type of candidate uh, protein, um, which is called lysine specific demethylase one. It's a demethylase. Um, so again, I mentioned like this, uh, again, going deeper into this epigenetic thing, um, as I mentioned, like epigenetic and genetic modification, they leads to, uh, leads to changes in the chromatin region or DNA binding to the histone and uh, this epigenetic machinery. And then the another pathway is like signaling pathways and they come together that leads to dysregulation of epigenetic enzymes. So once these epigenetic enzymes, they are dysregulated, it leads to a cascade of events that leads to cancer progression. So we need to know which are the specific targets which can be targeted um, for the therapy. And why we are studying head and neck cancer or oral skills commerce carcinoma, because this is very prevalent, like in US or world, worldwide. And maybe in India, it's a, like a bigger problem because we, uh, that betel nut, chewing, tobacco, uh, all these things, they look like very attractive, but they are like very dangerous because slowly it's like a, like a, like a poison, like slow poison um, with the chewing and all, um, it, it leads to progression in the, epigenetic and genetic environment in our cell, like oral epithelium, and that leads to the cancer progression. And this disease is like a very deadly disease because uh, high year survival rate is 50% means like if the person has a squamous cell carcinoma or oral cancer, 50% they will survive after five years. Um, just to explain a little bit like here, you see that ulcers, heart rates, ages, a dead keratocytes, and so these cancer cells start progression and then they start moving into the basal layer. And that leads to, um, uh, to cancer cell migration, and then it leads to metastasis in different cell layer. And in oral cavity, there are like several tissues that leads to the cancer progression, such as um, nasopharynx, oropharynx, hyalopharynx, la larynx, tongue, and all different tissues, uh, they, uh, they are subjected to the cancer progression. So again, as a veterinarian, uh, I was involved in this type of research and as a veterinarian, I had a responsibility to develop like some uh, oral cancer mouse model. So we developed like orthotopic uh, oral cancer model. Orthotopic means specifically in that specific tissues because we want to st study the micro environment in the particular tissue. So there should be some model like where cancer is uh, progress only in the, so if there is a breast cancer, then we inject the cells into the fat pad, memory fat pad. If there is a prostate cancer, then we inject the cells into the into the prostate. So that's that's how it works. So because we want to keep the same micro environment, um, so we develop, we had two different types of cell line. We identified two different cell lines, which either they metastatize and non metastatize. Metastatize means they are the tumor is at one side and it uh, moving to another places. And we integrated these cells with the DS red protein. It's called red fluorescent protein um, tag cells. So the cells, wherever they migrate, we can track them with the in vivo live imaging system. So on the left hand side, you can see this is in vivo live imaging system. So when we injected the cells, Cal27 cells, they stay, stay at the same place, uh, they form the tumor. But when you inject SCC2 cell, UMSC2, these are like a these cells, they metastatize to like different organs. And mostly these two different things, they correlate with the human, human patient also. So when there is an oral cancer, it can metastatize to different organs or it might not different. So depending on how your drug is behaving, 
uh, or what you want to test, you can choose the model system and then you can test your drugs. And we did publish like several studies using like uh, this, uh, this model. And now we are moving to like different models, uh, which, uh, which are very interesting. So as I mentioned, I am working my lab specifically working on license specific demethylase, which is an epigenetic regulator. And we found, so just to explain a little bit like, so we did first immunostaining. Immunostaining means when there is a antigen, the antibody boy into it, and then we can detect with the, with the substrate and die. So this is a human tissue microarray where there are almost like 96 tissues on the, on the small cover sleeve from different tumors with the different stages and different grade. And then we hybridize them with the anti, uh, anti LSD1 antibody and detect with the dye. And we found that this brown coloration is shows that like uh, the immunostained regions are higher with the progressive tumor stage and progressive tumor, tumor grade. Means with the increasing disease or increasing stages, we see increase in expression of LSD1. And this is the data from like a tissue, uh, genome database, tissue genome uh, database, like mRNA expression analysis. It also correlate with in several patients, like 300 or 400 patients. So next, um, the, there are, if there are genetic alteration, if there are mutations in this gene, it can also lead to survival. So in another cancers, like other cancers, like 200, so the survival is like 210 uh, months, means almost like 20 years uh, if there are mutation. But in oral cancer, this is very deadly uh, because if there are mutations in this one, uh, this LSD1, license specific demethylase one gene, uh, then survival is like 45 months. Although this is very limited data and we see very sporadic mutations, but they are very deadly. So going back to testing our hypothesis, whether this is a good target or not, then we, in, we implanted human tumors, um, tongue tumor into the, onto the back of the mice. And so these are new mice, they don't have immune system. And then we can grow, uh, grow these uh, tumors into the mice, like clinical tumors. And then we treated with inhibitor, which is a developed by GlaxoSmithKline GSK LSD1, and we found that um, with the you can see these black bars like without uh, inhibitor and with white bars like you can see that uh, there is a reduction in the tumor growth, meaning that this drug can work and it restricts the growth. And of course, it also shows uh, inhibition of specific targets and upregulation of ecadrine. So it affects like the on EMP also. Then in oral cancer, uh, this is one signaling, specific signaling pathway, which is very implicated in like a lot of different oral cancers, such as EGFR signaling pathway. And there are different ligands like EGF, TGFR. So either there will be or amplification, mutation in EGFR receptor, or uh, that leads to cascade of events, such as signaling uh, PI3, AKT kinase uh, pathway, mTOR signaling pathway. And all these things like mutation or dysregulation in this pathway that leads to uh, effect on survival, transcription, proliferation, um, and basically it leads to cancer progression. And as I mentioned earlier, like, so these epigenetic changes, they are introduced early so that you can see the signaling effect, whatever we are detecting maybe is like late stage, but we, our regulators, they work like efficiently in early stages. And then we try to see like whether this signaling pathways, they are inhibited here. If you induce like with TGF beta, uh, TGF beta, which is one of the inducer of the cancer or EGF, you see that uh, there is an increase in the proliferation. You can see that day seven, there is increase in proliferation. This bar grows like percent proliferation over the, over the control. And you can bring it back by addition of the inhibitor. So different doses of inhibitor, it can inhibit the, inhibit the proliferation. And of course, like it inhibits like phospho AKT ARC and all different signaling pathways. Then, we took like another approach to study this one. We wanted to delete this uh, protein specifically into the, into the tongue epithelium. Because here, this is the mouse epithelium, which are uh, in which there is a cancer progression due to induction of a uh, foreign cure, which is a tobacco carcinogen. Um, and we see this brown staining, again, as I have um, showed that immunostaining. So this is the same technique. And we see that there are brown staining like all over the places in the epithelium, epithelial layer, if you compare with this one. 
So we took this approach, we use some promoter, which is specifically expressed in the epithelial layer. This is called keratin 14 promoter. And this, we are using LSD1 flux mice. Flux means it has a log P region for homologous recombination, and there is a target gene in between. Uh, so we can delete that specific genes um, and we can, we can study like if the, what if what happens if this gene is not there. And then we have like the tamoxifen inducible system. Tamoxifen is an inducer. So this is a conditional system. When there is a tamoxifen in the system, we can delete the this gene. And we don't, if we want to, uh, don't want to delete, like we don't need to have that one. Uh, so this is completely controlled system. And in this system, when we uh, took these mice, and so these are the mice on the left-hand side shows that uh, these are like wild type mice with no 4 nq but when you cancer promoting agent like if food they've developed like bigger cancers and you can see in the histology also like there are raised lesions and then there is an invasion here um, at the bottom figure but when you inhibit this gene and treat with the cancer promoting agent you don't form it doesn't form the cancer meaning it indicates that like if we inhibit this gene uh, we can get rid of the cancer like in the oral cavity so Next, what we did, we did proteomics analysis. We extracted all the tissue, uh, extracted all the tons, extracted proteins from this one, and subjected to mass spectrophotry analysis. By this analysis, we can, uh, this peptide, like we, when we subject these tissues, it goes to uh, the peptide analysis and it will give, give you readout, like which proteins are upregulated, which are downregulated. Um, so here, there we found signature of certain proteins which are uh, involved in, um, um, these are like heat shock proteins, uh, some neutrophilic proteins and rho GTPs. So they are involved in uh, signaling, specific signaling. And we are working on this signaling, like which are the specific regulator, uh, downstream regulator of LST1. And then we, on the basis of this information, we took all this information from proteomic analysis, say we found like several proteins, like maybe 2,000, 3,000 proteins, and we selected some of them which are showing up or down, and we put them into a string functional analysis. So this is a functional network analysis where we put all the gene signature and want to see like who are their neighbors or like who has correlation with whom. So LSD1, Another name of LSD1 is KDM1A. And you can see that it has correlation with like a lot of different proteins. And now we are finding out like whether their interaction is critical uh, in pathogenesis of oral cancer. So again, now next approach, what we did, we took this inhibitor for this one, uh, which can inhibit LSD1 expression. First approach was genetic approach, like deleted into the, into the mouse. Second approach, we are taking that we are taking the inhibitor, inducing the tumor on the left-hand side with the vehicle, whereas on the right-hand side, the SP2509, we adding the inhibitor to this uh, to the mice tongue directly on the top, like this is a local application. And we found that these tissues on the right-hand side, they look like completely normal. So on the left-hand side, you see that everything is messed up, like semi squamous cell carcinoma, um, and then severe dysplasia. But on right hand side, you don't see this type of lesions like in lower or higher magnification. So it indicates that um, inhibiting LST1 with this specific inhibitor can have a clinical application. And already this drug is in a clinical trial with some other company for other indications. Um, and we are working on oral cancer uh, so that we can, if we can move forward with uh, some of the clinical studies in the future. Okay, so next thing is single cell RNA sequencing analysis. So this technique is uh, is very specific technique recently developed within like two, three, five, five years or like maybe less than five years. So, and now it is like very, very common. Uh, it's called 10X genomics method. So here, what we do, um, you take out the tissues or tumor and you can separate the tissues in the different cell types, okay? So individual one droplet will indicate like one, one cell. So all these cells, it goes through tenium genomics platform, and then we can sequence all these individual cells separately. And on the basis of sequencing, because it has a barcoded library. So on the basis of sequencing, we can decide whether if you are treated the tumors with this inhibitor or any drug, whether specific cell population is increased or decreased. Because this is the way of like looking unbiased approach. 
because the tumor in microenvironment is not like we are studying like epithelial cells or like some mesenchymal like infiltrated cells immune cells or any other cell type so we are not studying one type of cell but overall we are studying like human uh, complete like micro environment so we need to study like by unbiased approach so this way we can identify which specific cell type population we are targeting by inhibiting lst1 um and this is the analysis from the studies and so here you see that there this is a cancer so single cell analysis from the cancer versus normal so there are differences in this map like this map this is called u map and it has like a same uh, you see like same colors so these are all different colors they represent the cluster like one type of cells has one cluster second type of cell another cluster so there are several clusters like i believe like it's 25 24 clusters here and you can see and check like which cluster is increasing or decreasing so here you can see that this pink cluster uh, there are some changes in cancer versus like normal here it is reducing in the cancer whereas this cluster on with the red you can see that this cluster is increasing in the cancer so maybe this population is specifically responsible for inducing cancer or inducing the changes which are related to oncogenesis so next we treated this uh, mouse uh, with this inhibitor and we we targeted this population on the left hand side it shows like with without this is the cancer um, tissue and this cancer tissue treated treated with uh, with the inhibitor you can see with the inhibitor this cluster is uh, depleted so now next thing we are doing that we will characterize these cells we will analyze them again with the flow cytometry so whether this is a specific population and we will do some functional analysis validation to identify which specific cell populations are the target like either they could be like immune cell or they could be cells they are coming from like stem cell or a lot of different uh, cell types uh, so this is the way like we can identify a specific population um, which are the targets of lst1 now again uh, this is like a immunotherapy application um, because lst1 has a role in uh, maintaining stem cell uh, in immune suppression and a lot of different but in oral cancer it doesn't um, they we don't know much like how it has a role in immune suppression and immunotherapy so uh, our body has t cells and we have cancer cells or we if we encounter any infection t cell attack on them but this cancer cell they develop device a specific strategy they develop a ligand called pdl1 so this pdl1 bind to pd1 on the t cell so they lock this is a, just like a they just lock and they don't let them work so this is called these are called like exhausted t cells and exhaustion we need to release this exhaustion to make your endogenous t cell active uh, so that they can work on the tumor so there are several strategies where people are trying this immune so you can, either you can block pd1 pdl1 or like another co regulatory molecules and on the basis of that you can release this break and make the t cell function normally or like uh, kill uh, to kill the kill the cancer so we are looking whether lsd1 has a role in this type of mechanism um, so we had like very significant result but for some reason we could not uh, show this study because this is not like uh, published yet but we will have like very soon um, uh, or maybe like next time when we discuss so we come up with the specific mechanisms such as proncogenic factors they lead to aberrant activation of signaling pathways and these are the substrate histone s3k4 me2 dimethylation uh, is the substrate and we found that lsd1 it controls all these signaling pathways related to cancer like mostly in oral cancer like egfr hippo signaling pathway if we inhibit this one we can inhibit the, the this signaling inhibit the, the cancer progression so again now starting back to like second project um so i just like to share some of my good memories with my friend like when we were relatively young um this is yes series from 94 and 98 and here you can see like pictures on like we attended some conference and in the picture in the middle with like some of the professors um, which we worked um, in the past um, and this is like we are going to some conference and this is like one of the gatherings celebration and so all this 
pictures are like randomly selected on the basis of like whosoever like my friends were kind enough to send me some pictures and this this is again we did like when we were in the college like we did like national social service that was like one of the very good initiative we get the ability to serve the community and that's a very interesting thing um, and this is uh, on the right hand side this is a bus uh, which was very famous uh, and this is we had like autonomy in terms of like students where the where the where the driver of everything so everything depends on students which like where to go what to do uh, so the environment was a little bit different and i still remember the name of that person who was the driver zaglu zaglu kaka or zaglu kaka something like that and um, these are all my friends like um, from the, but to in order to show this slide like this slide is shows that like we were young dynamic uh, enthusiastic or maybe our stem cells like really like really active but now after 2022 years like we had a union, uh, reunion like last year uh, um, in december and we we can see there are certain changes in our friends like uh, maybe our stem cells are like responding less um, and then uh, i developed a hobby of like uh, going to bike ride with uh, some of my friends maybe motivation from some of my friends and so uh, this is a famous cape cod canal like where it goes up and down with the shipping and there is a very beautiful bike path near that and while biking i realized that like when i was biking when i was uh, i was like maybe teenager or like young age like uh, the biking was like very easy and but when you become like little bit little bit older like relatively older so your joints they don't respond the way it should be like you cannot bike like maybe some um, respond properly so there should be uh, there is there is a problem in functional ability of our joints so joint is contributed by uh, cartilage and bone um, and then we started working on some agent which can regenerate the cartilage um, um, like or prevent like aging related diseases um, and then we come up with a specific agent it's called lysol oxidase like two so this is another story of like uh, from the cancer to the, this is cartilage regeneration or bone regeneration so here what happens in osteoarthritis that we lose the cartilage um, either depletion of the proteoglycan or the lubrication is lost and uh, so we need to build this cartilage or there should be some agent which can stimulate um, the fluid in this joint so this happens in the knee osteoarthritis and TMJ osteoarthritis. So taking the motivation, like what uh, we are, our joints are doing, uh, we move forward with this, so this project. So we did, of course, we did fracture healing studies in which we made the fracture in the mouse and we found that certain genes are upregulated and certain genes are downregulated. One such gene was LOXL2. And we found that with LOXL2 uh, expression, increases with the with the healing then we thought to evaluate in other studies when we inhibited lock cell 2 in the in vitro system we found that chondrogenic lineage is completely affected meaning that it has some role in chondrogenic differentiation next what we did we took like human tissues and implanted onto the back of the neuromice mice and treated with this lock cell 2 protein expressing adenovirus uh, to overexpress this LOXL2. Uh, and then we isolated, extracted these tissues and from that extracted tissues, we did RNA sequencing. So extracted total RNA, then we did like ribo deletion, like different protocols and then converted to cDNA and then we did sequencing. And in the sequencing, we found that certain genes uh, such as agrican, SOX9, collagen type two, uh, means all these good factors on the on the right hand side, it shows in the heat map, uh, they are upregulated. And on the bottom, like the, this blue, uh, they are downregulated. So, all good factors related to cartilage regeneration, they are upregulated. Whereas the factors which are related to bad, to bad factors, they are downregulated. Um, next, we wanted to study whether it has a role in chromatin regulation. So, just to uh, give you an overview, heterochromatin is a closed chromatin which is like inactive, but euchromatin is an open chromatin. When chromatin gets open, uh, it enables some region to transcribe 
or the like mrna expression uh, it is correlated with the with the active stage of the chromatin so on the and there is there are specific techniques by which so here you can see this is tightly packed chromatin and there is loosely packed chromatin this is euchromatin so there is a technique it's called ataxic um in which they use transposes transposes like uh, it binds to the region which is open so here you can see on the right hand side like with the green color that on the left hand side it's not binding because this is completely tight but when it is open it binds to this region and then um you digest you remove the fragments um and then you can sequence this fragment so i can tell you another way so this is the transposis adapter it binds to the specific region but all the regions which is very tightly bound they are excluded and you can uh, purify these fragments and um, purify and sequence them and then all this sequence fragment then we need to align with the mouse genome or human genome um, and then on the basis of that you can see like which region was active so active means like it is open and then we can sequence them and uh, we can um, see like uh, uh, transcriptionally active regions and so by this way we can get a complete genomic landscape um, and we have identified certain factors which are uh, increased by uh, by these chromatin regions are opened by treatment of loxel2 so we believe we believe that there is some epigenetic mechanism behind behind this loxel2 uh, which can which is ruling like epigenetic regulation so next study uh, means in continuation so we published like some study here so i mentioned a story about like um, old age and young age and all the stuff so we took like a mouse model which is a progressive osteoarthritis mouse model so this model is very interesting so when they are young they are very they don't develop osteoarthritis 3 months of the age but when they become 6 months 9 months or 12 months they develop like progressive osteoarthritis so we use this model and then we injected adenovirus which are expressing our protein into this mice and we identify these sections we take the tissues and we try to see like whether all these genes good factors are increased and we see that uh this is again immunostaining analysis and we found that agrican sox9 uh, these are all genes are like a uh, related to good response they are increased whereas mmp13 which is a bad factor is like reduced so this is a validation in this in the model and then next we again i talked about like a uh, uh, the functional mobility so with the old age or with pain like uh, you develop certain signs like you joint does not respond they, you do not move properly uh we, if there is osteoarthritis or severe pathological changes um the mobility is reduced so this is a, a exhaustion exercise so we let the mice run on the treadmill for longer time and see like which get exhausted and we found that uh, the mice who over express uh, lock cell to protein they are um, they, are, they they are they are protective so they protect the cartilage so next we try to find out the mechanism uh, we found that loxel2 it works like inhibit some signaling pathways which are like catabolic uh, catabolic signaling pathway it up regulates certain genes which are related to extracellular matrix um and uh, and it also so means it has a balance like it prevents um, bad factors and it increases good factor and that's how it protects from the osteoarthritis and this is my lab we are funded by uh, nih um, another ctsr translational research institute some arc funding center of nanoscience and on the top like these are my like most recent students um, who are doctor of science students uh, they are going to the clinical degree and this is like a past members like who work with uh, with me uh, either masters or dsc and some volunteering students and then we are collaborating with like several different labs for biomechanical studies and uh, with mit and then this is ataxic for the hall with the harvard university uh, of course several labs in the uh, labs in the boston university um and i think that's all for today uh, thank you so much for listening my talk and i am happy to answer any questions or provide any feedback or guidance like if it is needed in the future thanks a lot dr manish for your presentation
almost seven question uh, that i have almost seen on the screen so we will take one by one so first question from from umer rasul he wants to ask tuna how it is related can you please elaborate tuna so um tuna feeding tuna so okay so basically there are three factors like right now they are thinking that it can be related to feline uh, feline colors common cell carcinoma so these are like etiological factors they are guessing that like uh, cats who are eating eating tuna they develop like common cell carcinoma um so this is just like their prediction but i don't know uh, like other labs they have done studies um but we just use this cat model as a as a as a model but there are smoking tuna and collar uh, these three factors etiological factors they are indicated uh, they are implicated in uh, oncogenesis of oral cancer okay now next question from dr adil uh, anamul haq he wants to ask how does the tumor volume increases in 32 weeks how does uh, so tumor it's a progressive volume. yeah so it increases okay so it get like saturated at certain points like 27 weeks or something like that uh, but it increases like very progressively so um so when you implant like say in immuno immunodeficient mice so it has a progressive progressive increase in the tumor because tumor cell ha they have a ability to grow so whenever wherever you implant the cells the cell number grow or uh, they they get recruit the machinery from outside uh, they hijack like lot of different signaling pathway for their use and that's how they grow um Uh, okay next question from kiran kashit he wants to know about uh, want to understand how our veterinary knowledge helps in medical research uh i think this is one of the like kiran thanks for this question i try to include that uh, veterinary knowledge so this is always like a back and forth so for example say like if we are using um uh say if you are developing drug for the cancer or any other treatment or uh, any therapies or maybe diet you are doing diet trial or cancer trial so um you want like some model system like you need model system to be tested you, we cannot test every drug into the human because they will have side effects and mortality and lot of lot of issues so we need a model system so these animals are can be used as a complete model system such as uh, say squamous cell carcinoma i mentioned that uh, um cat is a good model if you want to study like cartilage regeneration or uh, osteoarthritis pig sheep equine these are good models because we can make the changes in this large animal uh, like we can induce osteoarthritis and add some drug which can cure the osteoarthritis and potentially see like whether they are uh, they are um they are useful or not such as like say example monkey they are very famous for like studying like if you want to study vaccine um uh, it has to be tested tested in like monkeys and all also he wants to know about how much percentage of cancer globally percentage uh it number varies um like which means it depends like in different type of cancer uh so it okay so there is a very good correlation nowadays with the with the genetics um ethnicity and race uh but miss i would say i don't know like between like 2 to 5% or something like that or like in some countries like it's very high uh in india oral cancer is like very high compared to any other countries due to all this um, um factors and our diet habit and then petal nut chewing and all that stuff okay next question from purna uh, she wants to ask uh, or know about can normal ulceration leads to oral cancer as many people suffer from ulceration many times because of increase of acidic ph in stomach that's a good question uh yes that could happen 
but i don't know the, if there are evidences for that or like if proved evidences so if you give me like specifically what kind of like vaccination um, i can definitely uh, talk about it but vaccination acidic uh, diet can affect um, say hpv is like one of the factor and maybe i don't know hpv vaccine is linked to uh, to inhibiting the cancer uh, i think that's this like untrue thank you next question from shaina sayed uh, he wants to know about there is an interplay and cross talk between epigenetics modification and tumor suppressor genes but since these modification are less stable so how they can be helped to prevent metastasis of oral cancer so again uh, this is interesting thing uh, interesting question and interesting thing so for example like say pick 3ca this is like one tumor suppressor p53 another tumor suppressor so if you inhibit lsd1 in our study we see that this uh, uh, tumor suppressors they go up and there are studies where it shows that like some epigenetic regulators if you inhibit this epigenetic uh, pathways you promote the tumor tumor suppressor means you promote uh, the the suppressive means promote good response to the tumor so they they sometimes they work opposite uh, in most of the tumor so it's a good to inhibit this uh, like at least license specific b methylase to increase the increase the tumor suppressive function of p53 okay uh, next question from uh, gautam bojne yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. when to Just stop tk therapy any protocol for it when to stop a tki therapy any protocol for it uh protocol that's uh, i think we can talk offline about it uh so i think immunotherapy is like a like a good choice nowadays like enrolling in certain uh, immunotherapies um because uh, definitely i i would i would i would be glad to chat with this one like uh, uh with doctors okay uh, next question from dr adil he want uh, to know about what is the physiological function of lsd1 what is the physiological function of lsd1 lsd1 okay so it has different role lsd1 is implicated in stem cell mostly um so it is a component of a uh, normal cell so this regulation of lsd1 leads to cancer progression or like lot of different diseases so it maintains the um maintain the the balance between like uh, methylase and demethylase it maintains stem cell it maintains like it is involved in homeostasis um and it is means it's also involved in like normal ar architecture okay next question from chandrakant uh, his question is to prevent cartilage damage in pet is there a latest drug which contains uh lo x12 no no there is no study so this is like i think uh, only three papers it it is these are from my lab from my lab so one we published in like 2017 another in 2019 and then there is one paper like right now in 2020 uh, but there are no studies like showing that uh, with the cartilage so i think ours is the only lab and most probably like we are uh, so i think we are in process of getting like bigger grant right now uh, so we will study more in that area so next question which one is a superior or best molecular based therapy against cancer uh, superior um so okay so there are like conventional therapies like a combination like cetuximab with like so a lot of like egfr inhibitor then now most of the institutes here they are focusing on immunotherapy approach so if somebody wants to continue research uh, that's a good area to embark in uh, such as pd1 pdl1 ctla4 um 
and all, so all these like tyrosine kinase receptor therapies and all they are like a, like little bit like a, they, they are used but they are not like a, a more innovative but in my opinion i did not show one slide here because it's not published yet but we see with the immunotherapy combination we see specific response so i think it's it's ideal to study like immunotherapy which is very safe because immunotherapy has also like some disadvantages um so I would say like immunotherapy is the best option nowadays. Um, and in combination with epigenetic therapy, because you are resetting the epigenome. Uh, if you reset the epigenome, you can uh, target like anything. Okay, next question from Divyani. Uh, is there any chance if there is a gastric ulcer turns into the cancer? Yes, um, this is highly, uh, yes, that can. So, um, I think in one of my slide, I showed that uh, there is epidermis, there are ulcers, and then in, underneath of that, it developed like the cancer progression. But for developing cancer, it means like con continuous insult. If there is a, there's an ulcer and it continuously getting insulted with like some, some of the other factors, say gastric ulcer, if we talk about like gastric ulcer, like, so maybe like alcohol play a role or something like that. So if there is somebody has an ulcer and if he's drinking continuously or uh, continuously, maybe there are chances that it can develop into the cancer. Um, so, but continuous insult. Um, so only thing like to avoid that is to, to work on something which can block, like maybe some, um, some agent, something like, like uh, which, can, which can protect these ulcers. Um, Okay, thank you. Next question from Arvind. What subject in veterinary do we need to study to do this kind of research, pathology or physiology? Uh, everything. So it's not like, because basically, like, okay. So physiology is also related. Uh, pathology is also related. Because uh, everything, because research is not like one field, you know. So in my team, uh, I would say like I have immunologist, I have pathologist. I have a veterinary oncologist, I have a um, biochemist, I have like a uh, bioinformatics people. So basically like you need to decide like which direction you should go and what you like. So initially I was, uh, means when I was in Nagpur Veterinary College, I was interested to learn about biotechnology because somebody told, told me stories that like with the biotechnology approach, you can have a tail of a tail of a lion and head of some monkey or something like that. So they, these were like oh, weird stories, but that gives me like motivation, like we can think about like something uh, in biotechnology, but it's, a, it's a applied research. Um, uh, but every, every field can count physiology. Also, like if you want to learn about like exercise and stuff like that, that's a good area. Pathology is of course, like pathology is also, um, you look like, everything in different aspects, right? Okay, next question. You said of a gene LOXL2 expression improve the healing of cartilage. And he wants to know as whether there is any variance of expression of these genes with age. With age? Age, age. Uh, variants, right. So yes, I think there are age related changes. So it's basically LOXL2 and his isoforms. We saw that like its expression goes up and with the old age, like its expression goes down. Uh, but this is like only in mouse, but we don't have the data for the human. Uh, we are doing some bioinformatics analysis in that area. Um, and we'll be happy to like, if somebody has good expertise in like uh, bioinformatics and all that stuff, like we'll be happy to, uh, to okay. work with Next question, which is the best target cancer therapy or epigenetics therapy? So best, uh, you can go like with the approved. Uh, I mentioned like SDAC inhibitor, DNMT inhibitor, but it depends on like which signaling pathways which, which are altered. So, okay, so there are two things like for uh, cancer therapy. One, we need to look at like which signaling pathways are like inhibited and which cancer type. So if it is a breast cancer signaling pathway, like say HER2 or all these like uh, receptors are like, they, they should be targeted. But if there are some therapies where uh, 
uh, say like in oral cancer, like EGFR signaling pathway. So we need to go with cancer type and we need to go with signaling pathways are altered. So this, this is like a little bit like people are moving towards like precision medicine right now, means targeting specific component instead of like um, targeting other things. Okay, next question. Is there possibility of epigenetic drug causes autoimmune diseases? Yes, uh, it's possible. Um, because autoimmune is, is a side of your top, like, or maybe like immunotherapy also, how immunotherapy also can lead to autoimmune diseases. Um, so, the, okay, so, but with epigenetic therapy, like what we have observed, so normally, like, you give drugs like in higher concentration, like, say, or treating mice uh, with other, uh, like, um, uh, any other agent, like metrotrexate or any other drug, like, which are chemotherapic or conventional therapy. So you give like 30 milligram per kilogram or 150 milligram. But with the epigenetic regulators, you need to give like very low doses and they are very efficient. So I, I assume that like there could be like less um, adverse effect compared to normal uh, chemotherapy. And because, you know, like patient, they, um, the cancer patient, like most problematic thing is that instead of getting beneficial effect, like they get like side effects and we need to avoid that. So basically safety is the major issue. And I, again, come back to that same question that um, Dr. Bojne asked um, that uh, the inhibiting certain type of therapies, um, they have like more side effect than like uh, than, than good effect, beneficial effect. So considering these like epigenetic targets, they are very attractive nowadays. But I don't know, like may only STAC inhibitor is approved, DNMT inhibitor is in approved, but there could be like more to get approved. Okay, next question. Shall we use CRISPR-Cas to get rid of cancer? We can. There is a company called CRISPR Therapeutics. They are doing that like uh, in a lot of different. CRISPR-Cas, like you have to design like specific guide RNA. I, I think that's, that's um, means it is nothing is approved. But if somebody is developing, that's a wonderful thing, because it's not approved yet. Um, and but so if you are animals and you test it like some CRISPR like specific target, uh, that's a good thing. Okay, next question. There is a cross link of epigenetics and biological rhythm. How can it control melanomas? With biological rhythm, melanoma. So basically, like so. Epigenetics, I look as, as a as a as a subtle changes. Like means there are transient changes. It uh, induces expression, uh, like si expression silencing, right? So if there is there are certain events are like very highly upregulated in say melanoma, we can block it. And so even I think LSD one inhibitor they are also already used in melanoma. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that's all. Okay. Uh, next question: Which is the best medical therapy for osteosarcoma in felines? Uh, again, this is like a lot of labs. They are using uh, different drugs. Uh, I don't know, like something is approved yet, uh, but it's it's important. So basically, like when you want to develop the therapy, like first of all, you need to look. So how it is originated? Like so, basically, like just go to basic mechanism. See how it like which signaling pathways they are altered uh, and where you find a uh, best hit and on the basis of that you can think about like how you can inhibit uh, but this is osteosarcoma i believe this is a mesenchymal tumor so its mechanism is a little bit different than other epithelial tumors okay next question is uh, is veterinary graduate is eligible to do phd in oncology or stem cells in yes. harvard okay yeah. Next so question. I think, yeah, I think I, I would like to elaborate that. So here, um, I just want to means maybe this is like some students they are interested in like doing after PhD, so they can do like in any field. So here the the field is like little bit fluid, uh, in terms of like say if somebody is from uh, engineering, he can go to medical science. So it depends like which area. So. I saw like a lot of biomechanical engineers or mechanical engineers, they are working in biology. So it's, it's perfectly possible. Okay, next question. Uh, what is the best way to increase the genetic potential of animals? 
genetic potential uh, like uh, performance um, breeding is the conventional way but nowadays they are also introducing like uh, new genetic changes maybe crispr cas and like lot of different different things they are doing um, so okay next question with the lack of funding how epigenetics therapy is possible in veterinary medicine lack of funding um i don't see that there is a lack of funding means like it's, it's not going to happen in like one one day right so epigenetic therapy is like uh, it's just studying something like on this so basically like uh, i think in india also there are like several initiatives uh, where um, you can often like write like smaller funding so if you focus a little bit like on animal aspects uh, it's easy to get funding um, because you have that cutting edge like being a veterinarian um, you can so basically like again i started with like very little funding so first funding i got like 1500 or 17 1700 something like that from somewhere then i got like 4000 then got 20000 and then i like started building up on that one so it's not going to happen like in one day that you will get the funding uh, but um, but i think you can collaborate with like different scientists like uh, like outside or in india and see like what they can find okay next question which organ most preferably affect as adverse effect in epigenetic drug it depends um liver i would say uh, liver lung mostly but um, it depends like it depends on the mechanism of that drug um, okay so last question from my side raus sarcoma and venereal granuloma are pathogen inflict malignancy can epigenetic therapy be of any use in such situation yeah definitely like epigenetic therapy could be useful for everything like you just just need to find which epigenetic regulator they are up regulated and down regulated and design on the on on the basis of it. okay thank you now we come to the concluding remark so good evening friends uh, here we come to the end of second day international webinar i dr shubhangi varke on the behalf of department of veterinary microbiology and animal biotechnology teaching and research cell thank to everyone related to this event on the behalf of my institute entire fraternity and organizing secretary and committee i feel immense pleasure to take this opportunity to propose a vote of thanks let me first of all shout me giving the almighty god for making this international webinar such a resounding success i especially express my deep regards and gratitude to karnal professor m patrkar honorable vice chancellor maharashtra animal and fishery sciences university nagpur for his valuable guidance constant encouragement motivation and advice for organization of this webinar he is a true inspiration to all of us and we are really grateful to him i would like to convey my thanks to our eminent speaker dr manish bes assistant professor department of translational dental medicine western university medical campus usa who spared the valuable time from his busy schedule to grace this webinar with extremely relevant address on epigenetic therapy in cancer in contemporary scenario on the behalf of organizing committee i congratulate him for his wonderful presentation He rightly talks about therapy in cancer that must guide in achieving goals, intention, and aspiration in today's challenge. I am sure collective as approach would definitely help us to regulate and manage the problem regarding cancer in better way. Beside critical situation in the USA due to COVID-19 and his busy schedule, the amount of risk and efforts he has put in to make this event successful is really commendable. Our best wishes are always with you. for all your future endeavors i must say that we all are inspired by your research work thank you once again i am thankful to dr s b kavitkar associate dean nagpur veterinary college nagpur for always encouraging us and providing opportunity to organize such events i express my special thanks to university library and shri sunil gavande ji for providing all the necessary facilities for smooth conduct of this webinar 
I would be failing in my duty if I do not express my deep sense of gratitude to our knowledge partner, Vetina Healthcare Pune, and his team for all the technical support and their tireless contribution they have made. The web this webinar could not have been possible in such a short span without their help. I must say, behind every successful program lie the manifold attempts of our committed faculty. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the immense contribution of our dedicated faculty. A warm thanks uh, goes to Dr. Manoj, Dr. Su uh, Suji, Dr. Mayur, who help us to excel in all endeavor. My deep sense of appreciation and thank to all the participants who host to be alive with us and attend webinar with a great enthusiasm and make it successful event. Thanks for your overwhelming response. My sincere gratitude also goes to the organizing committee for taking topics that really matters in today's age and time. I thank one and all for being a part of this knowledge sharing quest. Thank you for sparing your valuable time. Looking forward for more such scientific deliberation. Thank you all for making this webinar a huge success. Have a great evening. In the last with Indian tradition, I must say namaste. Stay healthy, stay safe. Ma'am, uh, we have with us our CEO, Prakash Kare, who wants to express the words for us. Uh, I wish to first uh, thank Dr. Manish for such a wonderful and relevant topic webinar. Very interesting presentation. I wish to thank you also, all the participants who were present on this webinar. Vetina is setting up a knowledge center for the benefit of veterinary professions, farmers, and pet parents, as well as the veterinary uh, faculties. So we will be very happy to associate as a knowledge partner whenever there is such an occasion where we could be of any help to this uh, fraternity. So I once again thank you all and wish you all the best. Stay safe. So lastly, I just want to say a few things. Um, so although we we came up from like the, this Nagpur Veterinary College. We have still affinity for the college and we want to contribute like everything, whatever we could do best for our ability. And also like as a veterinary profession, like if something, some knowledge, we know a few things because by we got the opportunities because uh, due to some circumstances, so we got success to some extent, but we want to contribute like our success with like others my friends, my colleagues. So it's, it will be interesting. Like if you find out such a platform, like where we can bridge this gap, either to guide like new students, incoming students, incoming faculty, people and guidance. So that, that will be very helpful to uplift our, our community. And I'm, I'm like, I also talk to my colleagues. There are several people who will be interested like in presenting their views. And then one interesting thing I discussed with my friends, like from mostly from the S series that to start something like uh, giving their like career perspectives. Say if you, somebody started from NBC and how he want, went to up. So the lifetime experiences, that will be like a wonderful thing. Um, and finally, I am thankful to all organizers and um, the college, Nagpur College, and I miss all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. And I think uh, it will be our pleasure to present such webinars in future. We'll always helpful for the every colleges, uh, every uh, you know professors in the uh, university. And definitely, we will help um, many miles to uh, students, veterinarians, field professions, and uh, again, the farmer and paid parent. Thank you from my side. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.